you guys are go-getters. Yeah. Yeah. They yeah, are stupid. I just don't sleep for all of them. Um, I think we're a little dits. <laughs> <laughs> Meet Mishama Bailey and John Morisano, New Yorkers who moved to Savannah, Georgia to start the award-winning restaurant The Gray in 2014. I want to blanch them before we grill them so we can get the right amount of char on them. Before The Gray, Jono was an entrepreneur in the media startup world. Mishama, a social worker turned personal chef, turned sous chef in New York City. But as executive chef at The Gray in 2019, Mishama won the prestigious James Beard Award for Best Chef in the Southeast and was featured on Netflix's Chef's Table. Since then, the two have opened another restaurant in Savannah, are working on opening two more in Austin, Texas, and recently released Black, White, and The Gray. See? Go-getters. It's really rewarding, you know? And and I I feel like I've grown so much. Like, Jono's always been like, Jono's very open. Very, you know, Jono likes rom-coms and he's very open about <laughs> So what? <laughs> like, why do you why do you gotta do that to me? He's very open about his feelings and you know how much he loves and appreciates our partnership. And you know, and I think I feel I feel like honestly, like the last eight years have been like the best eight years of my life. As for the book, it started out as an agent's idea for Mashama to write a cookbook. I really wanted Jono to get this guy off my back. He <laughs> followed me around this festival for three days. And every time I looked up, he was there talking about a cookbook and talking about us being in business together. While the final version does have recipes at the end of each chapter, Jono originally convinced the agent he would write a book on entrepreneurship and his idea to open a restaurant in a formerly segregated bus terminal in Savannah, even though he had zero restaurant experience. Eventually, Mashama agreed to add her antidotes. They would be handwritten in the margins. Can I just say this? We literally marginalized the Black woman. Yeah. So it's like... I never felt great about that concept, but I said, okay, let's see what it looks like. And I remember telling a friend of mine about it where I took a, I went away, wrote, did some writing, came back and on my way back to Spain, I was like, so listen, and this is the concept and I'm going to be in the margins. And as soon as I said it, it was just like, yeah, that's not a good thing. The two realized they had a lot more to discuss and say. They rented a flat in Paris for six weeks to concentrate on writing during the day. At night, they ate out to work on expanding the Gray's menu. In the end, they wrote a book about the challenges of starting a restaurant, but also about their relationship as a white male and a black female in business together in the South. That's when it became a book about race, class, and culture. We talk with the two about the tough lessons. It's very painful. And all they've learned along the way. It seems like you could write a sequel to Black White for Gray, right? <laughs> I'll give them any ideas. Okay? I'm ready. I'm ready. <laughs> Welcome, Mashama Bailey and Jono Morisano. They are the founding partners of the awesome restaurant, The Gray in Savannah, Georgia. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much for having us. What, what I find so interesting, I mean, you guys went through a lot, as, as you see in the book, but I've, I've heard it said that your guys' partnership didn't really solidify, or you really didn't get into the, the nitty gritty of your relationship until you wrote this book. Is that right? Mm -hmm. That's true. We've had a lot of hard conversations and, you know, it wasn't until we really started to get into the book um, together that I, I realized that our relationship wasn't ready for the topics that we needed to talk about. It was really nice being business partners and having our own um, positions or our own jobs in the restaurant, but when we really started talking about the things that motivated us and the things that scarred us in the past or, or what are the things that are going to propel us to be closer or better owners, um, we never really talked about things like race or class. So um, this book really brought a lot of that stuff to light. I, yeah, I, I agree. Um, my only takeaway from the whole 
process was have the uncomfortable conversations. Mm -hmm. That's it. Like, you know, we're not, we were, we really didn't set out to give anybody advice. Like, you know, we were like, we're, we just, we're living this life and, and everyone who's, you know, everyone who works for a living, like, it's like, it's hard. Right. And creating, you know, building and creating, you know, is one thing, but then, you know, how, how did, how do you thrive in that? And I think that what the, what the writing of the book process, why it brought our relationship to the next level is we went, oh, you know what? We actually do come from really different places and we have very, 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 very different viewpoints on things. And I have a background that's sort of steeped in New York City, cops, firemen, Staten Island, you know, where, you know, the people that I grew up with and hung around with and the family I grew up in, you know, viewed people of color as the enemy in a lot of ways, you know, and I've said that in the past and, and I don't, and it's true, bringing that to my relationship with this person who I had developed this very, very, as Mishama said, it was nice. We had this very solid business partnership that was growing and it was burgeoning and we hit a lot of rocky points along the way. And frankly, we still do, you know, not as often, but we do. And when they're rocky, they're rocky. But when we shared all of this stuff about ourselves, when I dropped that initial manuscript on Mishama that started to talk about my views on race, that she was not prepared to read because she still thought she was getting the business book, um, that created dissonance and discomfort and a lot of strife, frankly, between us for a long time. It's very painful. It's just a painful, it's a painful reality to live in. So you can't really dwell in it. You know, like, I think it has to, I think you have to reference it. I don't think you can forget who you are, where you come from. And then we also understand that there's um, this barrier that sometimes we break through and sometimes we don't. And I think, um, in Savannah, there is a real divide because the city is just basically divided into sections and in the restaurant borders the historic district and right behind it is Yamakra Village, which is the housing project. And all along Martin Luther King Boulevard, there you can tell that that was a once an affluent Black neighborhood, and now it's just forgotten about because everyone sort of fled the downtown. Even the businesses that supported the neighborhoods bordering downtown are gone. And so how can you be a positive role model in a city that, um, or in a section of the city that has forgot that, you know, the people that you want to be a role model for has really kind of like forgotten about or don't, you know, don't really patronize. Like I think every day I try to figure out like, how can I be more affluent in what I do in order to inspire people like me to do what I do? Jana, when you set out, I mean, you were looking for a business partner. You didn't want just an executive chef. You wanted... Mm -hmm. A business partner, and and <laughs> in the book you explain you you went through quite a few chefs before you got to Mashama. Yeah, yeah. I mean, to me, like because I had done a lot of startups in my life, and the startups that I worked in were, you know, actually they were all over the map. But it was like we, I was, I, I just as Mashama said, I like to build things, and what I learned for, or start things actually is what Mashama said. Hence my startup background. <laughs> um, what I learned through that is like, know what you know, but really know what you don't know, right? And I knew that I was very passionate about food and wine from, a, I was a child, right? And then all through my adult life, I was passionate about it. And I love restaurants, right? And I don't just love our restaurant, which I think is one of the great restaurant experiences you can have. And I, and I, I, and I try and say that as objectively as possible, but I love restaurants. Like my wife and I have had this life with no kids and constant travel and busy, you know, sort of we devoted where we both just work. That's our identity. And our entertainment has always been restaurants. And so I knew I knew that, but I knew I knew nothing 
about how a commercial kitchen runs. Mm -hmm. I knew I knew nothing about steps of service. I knew. And so <clears throat> to me, like I could see myself figuring out how to be a manager and work on the floor and run the front and run in the front of the house once I had enough experience, but I had no vision for how I could run a kitchen. And so it was really a simple equation for me. It was like, you need a business partner mm -hmm. who can come up with, you know, what are we going to cook? What are we going to serve our guests and run that end of the business? So that was always the search that I was involved in. And at first I was just like, all right, you know, let's, you know, we'll meet whoever's out there. And I started to meet whoever was out there and everybody had kind of short hair and they were white and they had tattoos and they were men. And I kept looking around Savannah as I would walk to work. And I'm like, that's not, you know, if I get that guy, he and I, are only going to appeal and this was a business decision by the way mm -hmm. that we're only going to appeal to other you know people who look like us and everybody i met with kind of looked like that and they were really good cooks like a, like award-winning cooks and like um you know that's who i was kind of targeting and then one day i was just like you know what i need somebody who looks exactly the opposite of me and i was you know i'm really base in my sort of <laughs> thought process it's like i'm a man She's got to be a woman. I'm white. She has to be black. I didn't even, I wasn't even like smart enough to go like, she has to be a woman of color. Like, you know, <laughs> right. it was like, I'm white. She's black. That's what it is. You know? And that's when I started to um, think about the business partner being someone who looks like Mashama and not me. Right. And Mashama, I mean, for you, it took a little bit to like really step into the shoes of a founding partner. Right. I mean, <laughs> I, I mean, cause that's an unusual model. It is. And it also like, you know, for me, I was like, wait, okay, so you want me to be a partner, but I'm not putting up any, like, how am I, what's the equity part of it? Like, do I need to put up money? Like, do I need to, I'm not, I've never been an executive chef. So, you know, I, I was a sous chef moving into an executive chef role. And, um, you know, I was, I was getting a salary. It just didn't feel like I was a partner. You know, it didn't make up like I was getting a partner. Now all those, all those things were necessary. Right. But it was just, it felt like, it felt like, and because I was just so unused to that structure that no one's ever sort of offered me before, there was never an opportunity of ownership other than one that was in my imagination. I just kind of kept myself in this sort of like, well, what I'm the sh I'm the chef of the restaurant and I'm employed by the owner of the restaurant. And I think it took a lot of conversations, a lot of shifts and roles and really understanding what we were both bringing to the table and what the equity really was for me to really step into the fact that, okay, yeah, I own, I own this place. You know, I'm an owner of this place. And it took years, actually. It took a few years. I mean, you read about your growth and that, you know, you had to learn how to say like, this is what I want. This is yeah. what I want, right? Yeah. And I'm still learning yeah. because I think that, you're so distracted by being the chef of a space. Like it's all consuming, mm -hmm. um, growing a team, figuring out how to, I didn't go, I, I moved down with Paula and, you know, she was my sous chef. It's really difficult to build a team in a different city when you don't really have any references for that city. So that was hard enough. And that was, that, that took time in itself to develop. And then it was like, oh, okay, well, you have to take on the business aspect of it too. You have to answer emails and you have to be a part of the management team and you have to engage or lead the staff with the, you know, or you have, you're influencing the culture of the restaurant. So it took time for me to even develop the bandwidth for that type of thinking. Not just in other city, but I mean, you went from New York City to the South. I mean, you talk about just even in the way that people view food, right? Right. Yeah. Even in the way that you order food for the restaurant, like in New York, you can order food until, you know, midnight, you know, but, but in, in Savannah, we had to get really used to ordering food by 4 PM. And it's like, well, by 4 PM, there's no way that I would know what I need for the next day because I, we haven't even opened yet. So it's just like such an interesting way. Like I was, the way I was trained to cook in restaurants, it completely got turned on its ear a little bit 
versus, you know, not. Yeah. So it was just, it was, it was very different, but, um, and it was very hard. It was very, very, it was a very hard journey because I was so out of my comfort zone. And I think, you know, to Jono's credit, he is used, he, he almost likes being out of his comfort zone. And I, because I think it helps grow, it helps you grow. And for me, I was very comfortable in my comfort zone, but I also think that, um, my personality, I want, I've always wanted more, I always challenge myself. I think of myself as a strong person, you know, physically, intellectually. And so I think this was a, a good opportunity for me to just say, okay, I can do this. And it wasn't until I physically saw the building that I felt like I can do it. It was decrepit. It was a, almost like a warehouse. It was, it was cold, drafty. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I stepped in that space, I was convinced that it was for me. It was for me to build a restaurant in that space because prior to that, I just was, I was kind of, quite frankly, humoring him. <laughs> I was like, sure. Which yeah. I will be honest with you, that has never ended. <laughs> There's a lot of humoring that gets done in this relationship. Well, I'm going never... from that direction to this one. <laughs> Well, and the fact that you guys, I mean, two New Yorkers starting a, a restaurant in Savannah, I mean, the whole fact that that even happened, I mean, there's like a Icelandic volcano that has to happen. And, right? <laughs> it's just like this wild, I, read the book, because I mean, there's like all these wild kismet things that have to happen for it to, for the restaurant to be. It was like, it's so funny. Like my grandmother was an LPN most of her life. And um, when she passed, she passed away in January of uh, 2000, uh, four, uh, 2015. And it was like, we just opened. It was crazy town. And I went to her funeral and I was living with my grandmother when I met Jono and I moved out of her house to move to Savannah to open up the gray. And so um, when she passed, it was really, you know, it was really sad, but my cousins found a Greyhound Lines first aid kit in her, in the bottom corner of her closet. And this is like an old school first aid kit that's like made of metal and it had like trenches of like iodine and wraps and barely used. And so when that kind of popped up, I think that's when I was like, it was just like, okay, all the signs are here. Like, we just need to figure this out. Like, this is this is our course, you know? Yeah. We just need to figure it out. Yeah. yeah, I forget that. That's a good, that's a really good story. Mishama, the restaurant lives in a formerly segregated bus station. In the back, there's the colored waiting room. You can't help to be humbled by that kind of history. Having a chef's table episode so is when the restaurant, just as, just people coming to the restaurant and the awareness of the restaurant, it started to become very diverse. And so, yes, I think that there is an impact that we are having on food and especially food in Savannah. The exposure um, from an episode like Netflix and the exposure of the restaurant in general is um, starting to really bring people out of color. And the food aspect, I do think that there is definitely a reimagination of Southern food, um, especially from the Black perspective. I think we have a very particular perspective and you can see a lot of young black chefs out there trying to do their thing. And people are going the Sean Brock route. People are going, the, you know, Edna Lewis route. People are going the Mashama Bailey route. So you're really starting to see a lot of expression of what we grew up with and personalizing our point of view as far as food is concerned. I think what, with the chef's table, what Mashama did is sort of take control of the narrative and i think that the chef's table people were really good and wanted to like what they're really good at is allowing people to tell their story and when we were talking about this last night it's like you know that was a, it wasn't a turning point like oh you know people all of a sudden heard about the gray because we had had a lot of people talking press talking about us up until that point 
But it was really the, t- the point in time where Mishama said, you know what? I'm going to tell this story. <laughs> I'm going to tell my story. And I think it was an aha moment for us. And I actually think that it was probably when the book was really conceived. And we decided that, you know, we're going to, we're not, we're not going to, we're, we're going to, we, we're really appreciative of all the press we've got. And, and because that puts people in your restaurant and it allows you to survive, frankly, but we're going to start telling the story from our own perspectives. I think that that's what was really significant about chef's table and Mishama seizing the reins on her view on Southern food, her view on Port City Southern, her view on black food and her, and her place in it. You know, she was someone who no one heard of. And th- and all of a sudden she had this powerful voice and yeah. she really like I, I saw her sort of like, you know, stand up really straight. I mean, you guys, you talk about how family I mean, you're just talking about your grandma and family played such a big role in in, you know, the food growing up and these big family meals. And then when you guys hire people at your restaurant, you're talking about this familial atmosphere. And then this pandemic hits and your family is torn apart. You know, yeah. how, how, how did that, I mean, it seems like you, you could write a sequel to Black Boys <laughs> Great, right? I'll give them any ideas. Okay? I'm ready. I'm ready. <laughs> we were in Paris. As soon as she says yes, I'm in. Ready to like, we were in Paris, almost like in tears, right? For like four weeks, you know? And the fifth week, John was like, well, will we write our second book? I'm like, if you don't... <laughs> you don't know. She... Too soon. Mishama has walked out on me twice. That was... Actually, she's only walked out on me once. But she almost walked out on me that night. Um <laughs> I was not ready for the for her the level of her going from like oh we're having a nice meal eating oysters on toast or eating sardines on toast to her almost like slapping me. <laughs> um, <laughs> but you know what? The, here the pandemic, it's like the thing that people need to know most is that the gray is really lucky, right? People go to the gray. Um, and, and people, you know, our team is so committed, like our management team has been with us, you know, a lot of them from the beginning, but restaurants are still in a lot of trouble. You know, your local restaurant is really in a lot of trouble, you know, like the food gets to your table late, like your old favorite server isn't there, like all that stuff, like stop with the Yelp reviews and (laughs) and just like sort of. Like if you want, if you want those businesses in town, you know, get, get their backs until we get out of all of the aftermath from this because staffing and food costs and supply chains and all that stuff you hear about on the news is really real. I actually think that the best thing that come at, that could come out of the pandemic is the re-education of the guest and their expectations and stop making restaurants compete on you know, on, on, on price and portion size, Mm -hmm. you know, when you want something more from them and listen, I'm for the local diner, you know, Misham and I, like, we don't have a meal. We don't enjoy like, and we eat everything. And, you know, like I eat egg McMuffins from the road, like I'm down, but (laughs) don't, you know, like if you think it's over, it's not over. That's my takeaway from the pandemic from a, how it's impacting small business. We don't have a lot of time. I'm so curious. In, in the book, it just mentions that while you're in Paris, you guys got tattoos while, you know, commemorating certain things. Oh, Anything God. commemorate this time? Did you guys get tattoos? With... No more tattoos. No? Yeah. <laughs> it was just you, John. I made, a, I made a tattoo appointment uh, this John morning. John's into tattoos lately. No, I and always you... was. Yeah, it was my thing. But I worked in the corporate world, so I couldn't really have them. And then when I became like a restaurant person, I was like, oh, I can do whatever I want now. So do anything for the gray? The book opens with a really tragic night in the history of the gray, which was if there was like a threesome, you know, if Misham and I were like sort of the, the, the two people of the gray, we had this young gentleman who worked with us. And his name was Scott Waldrip. And Scott was with us from the beginning, started as a bartender. Then he became like sort of our lead bartender. He became the first general manager in 
the history of the great because i kind of like even though i didn't know anything i ran the restaurant Misham and Scott were super like best friends, but we all had this very, very close relationship and he was an activist. He was really activated in the LGBTQ community in Savannah, um, just like a leader, like everything about Scott was leadership and Scott was killed. And that's how the book opens um, was that night that he and Misham were out and I, 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 no spoiler here, but like really terrible, terrible, tragic violent event that Mishama and Scott had nothing to do with, but he ended up killed from it. And we always talked about Mishama and I, and that was a, the most seminal, the reason the book opens and closes with that is it's the most seminal thing that has ever happened to me in my life. And Mishama, and I speak for Mishama here, like it was so seminal for us and the gray and the history of the gray. And we always said we were going to get tattoos, um, about the gray, if we like made it three years, I forget what our original sort of deal was. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But it was the one year anniversary of Scott's death, or it was it actually was. during it was the filming during, of the chef's it table. It was during the filming of the chef's table. Yeah. We got tattoos that are both the gray and Scott related. Um, they're slightly different from um, each other, but they're we got them the same night with another woman we worked with very closely. Um, yeah, so we do have gray tattoos. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, we are out of time. You guys, this has been so interesting. You guys are a pleasure to talk to. I could talk a lot longer. <laughs> we can too. We can too. <laughs> and don't forget, you guys can get your books at Left Bank Books. They're our partner in this, and it is a valuable read. You'll learn so much about the restaurant business, race relations. You'll be thinking about things um, you may not have thought about before. It's it's a it's a great book. Thanks again, guys. Thank, Thank you so you. much.